your third best writer was Marguerite Scott, and she decided she did not want to continue. I'm sorry, who, who's who's concerned by this? Readers of Transformers oh, books oh, who I'm are sorry. enjoying the current I, I, line of books right, that okay. are, are as good as they've ever been. So people who shop at other stores. Right. Come on and visit for any occasion. So keep patting down, waiting, comics and conversation. Keep the conversation moving along. From Challengers Comics and Conversation in Chicago, this is Contest of Challengers. And now, here are Patrick Brower and W. Dal Bush. Dal, I'm going to jump right in here. Okay. And for weeks, months even, I don't know, even last year before ALA, we've been talking up a graphic novel that just came out this week. And it's as good as we hoped it was going to be. And that is, My Boyfriend is a Bear. Yes. About a young woman who, after nothing but romantic disappointment, starts dating a bear. A bear. A real bear. It's not a cartoon bear. It's a bear. Yes. It's an actual bear. And this is a romantic comedy style graphic novel from Oni Press. And it is very good. Highly recommended. Yep. It's out now. We have it in the store. And I feel like there was a point where I was pitching Be Prepared a lot. Mm -hmm. And then it came out and people started to read it and said, oh, this is good. Yeah. My Boyfriend is a Bear, equally good. It's very good. Different Definitely. audiences, though. <laughs> True. But, uh, I mean, that's just a level of trust people should have with us. Okay, sure. Because... As much as I do love My Boyfriend is a Bear, it's just a link. It's a segue mm. to what I actually want to talk about. What's that? That is another graphic novel that's coming out very soon that is equally as good as both of those things and kind of fits right in between the, them for the audience. Okay. And that is Spectacle. Hey, Spectacle. Megan Rose Gedris. Spectacle by Megan Rose Gedris, which is a YA adjacent. I mean, Just YA. It, I mean, they, YA. they don't actually market it as YA, but no, we but assume comic that publishers it, tend not to. But right. it's it's definitely YA. Well, also, I, I don't like saying YA because I don't want to turn adults off from it. A lot of adults read YA, well, of course, because there's a lot of great YA stuff. Yeah, they're they're the A in YA. Spectacle is coming out. In two weeks. Sure. And we have finally, after, oh man, uh, how many months? Six six months? A long time. A long time. Of, of talking and planning. We will be having a spectacle release party on Friday night, May 25th, starting at 7 p.m. Creator, Megan Rose Gedris will be there. She is also known as... Rosalarian, a webcomic creator. Mm -hmm. You and Me Dream is her webcomic. So no, it's not just a, it's not just a, a signing and release event. We'll have, of course, a ton of copies of the book. But Megan is very adventurous in her life and has suggested it be circus-themed. So what that means is we won't have a full... Three Ring Circus, or Big Top, or Lions. Sure. We, we, we legitimately talked about getting Lions. Weird. Um, what this does mean, though, is that circus costumes are encouraged, not required, not required, but if you want to dress up circusy, Megan's favorite costume or favorite look will win original art of hers. Cool. That's yes. Surprise. And we will hopefully have a signature spectacle cocktail. I say hopefully because it has not been created yet. Okay. But with the success of the Patrick and Dow <laughs> cocktails from the anniversary party, sure. uh, I feel like making a batch of something ahead of time okay, cool. is, is worthwhile. And I know it's only two weeks out, so we're, we're really pushing to uh, get this done. And I, you didn't make the flyer today, right? I did. You did? I did. Okay, I... I there was a reason I never made okay. copies because everything wasn't confirmed. Okay, is that, it that was my placeholder. She she really wanted us to put the costume stuff on the flyer. I will print out a label and fix it to everyone. Okay, 
Yeah, I, I assumed I, I didn't I, bother I, to. I, I did it as quickly as I could because I, I know I I figured you would, but because I hadn't made the PDFs on the desktop, I thought that was a sign. Hey, it's not done. I mean, it could also have been a sign that that was the point you got up to before you switched computers or yeah, something else. The, and, it, and if more I don't than make anything, the PDFs, future reference of knowing the PDFs is not done. Sure. I, the the problem with waiting is that normally I would maybe go Sunday night. I can't Sunday night, so like it's basically a thing of like I don't want and I can't go Monday night. So it would basically be a thing where they wouldn't, we wouldn't have flyers until I was planning to do it tomorrow after work. After it's already done. All you got to do is now a little little mailing All label right. says costume contest and just slap. I only did like twenty of them. You only got to do okay. one sheet. Okay, cause you're done. All right, all right. I literally thought about. I, I, I mean, yeah. I don't know at what point in the day that I was talking to her I, where you were. Sure, even, even you were not. I mean, you were you were. Either on your way or already done. Yeah. Even even now that you've said that, I still feel like having a flyer with some information on it is, is almost more important than getting the flyer with all the information on it. Just to start telling people there's an event, you know? Even if they don't know about a costume contest, nine times out of ten they weren't going to wear a costume anyway. You know what I mean? Like Yeah, they, but that tenth. Oh, man. Sure. And, and, and they'll so find out about it. But yeah, I just yeah, I, I definitely not from this. But still. I, I wanted to get something out. Okay, so fine. People fine. could know about it. But just so we're clear, okay. Future reference: if the PDFs aren't on the desktop, it's not done. Okay. Uh, so yes, that is coming up, and that should be fun. Sure. And it's it's going to be the first of three weekends in a row with after uh, our event type things at the store. The week after that is the Adventure Time charity event, and. According to FedEx, we just got all the art delivered, but I wasn't there today, so I don't know for sure. Sure. And then, wait, no, it's only two. There's nothing the week after that, right? I no, there, no, I there don't is, think there's currently it's just anything two, it's after two. June second. Right. The the thing that we thought was going to be on June 9th is now sometime in July. Okay. So that'll be an announcement later. But yeah, so these these next two events are going to be very different from each other, different from events we normally hold, but super fun. But more importantly. Spectacle and My Boyfriend is a Bear, two wonderful graphic novels that are uh, a surefire winner. Not that I want to talk about Free Comic Book Day for longer, <laughs> okay. but I will point out that this year, more than previous years, we've gotten so many more of the, hey, do you have any leftovers? Mm -hmm. Or, I've never been to Free Comic Book Day, but I'm interested in the comics. Do you have any? Mm -hmm. it, it's just that, you know, there, there's one rule for Free Comic Book Day. We only basically have one rule, and that's if you show up on Free Comic Book Day, we will give you free comics. But there's a, a part in there where it's, if one thing happens, then another thing will happen. It's a cause and effect thing. And the cause is, you showed up on Free Comic Book Day. And the effect is, you got free comics. You don't do the cause, you don't get the effect. We usually get a couple of people, but this this year, it seems that it's been... Yeah. Instead of a couple, you, it's been several. To my knowledge, you've never worked the, the Sunday after Free Comic Book Day at Challengers, so let me assure you, every single year there's people who come in the Sunday after, call in the Sunday after, who are like, hey, I wasn't able to make it, and there's either, it's I forgot, or the, there's some sob story. There's some like, I meant to, but the X, Y, and Z. And so every, everyone's got a reason why they couldn't come in, but they still want the free comics. And... Yeah, no. I here here's the answer that everyone got to the question of do you guys have free comics left over from Free Comic Book Day? We do. They are buried in the back. We we won't need them again until next year's Free Comic Book Day, so we do not keep them handy. They get boxed up, they get put in the back, they get buried under a lot of boxes cuz we don't need to get to them for another year. So, yeah, we had some left over. Come in next year on Free Comic Book Day, you'll get a shot at them. My answer is a little different than yours. My answer is Nope, because we don't have any more free comics, because we're not giving them out anymore, so they're not free. That's how I look at it. Okay. So far, we haven't had anybody come in and say, hey, I'm an educator, can I get any for my class, which we seem to always get. Sure. But almost no one ever does that ahead of time, saying, hey, if you have any left over. Yeah, at which point it's super easy, because, yeah, as we're boxing them up for next year, we can just set some aside. Yeah. And then they're waiting for you whenever you want to come pick them up. But if you're asking two, three, four, ten days after the event, th they are not accessible. They are not something that we can just, like, duck into the back and grab. That's not where they are. They are buried. You know, one of the free comic day books, uh, and one that we still have left over, is Barrier Number 1 from mm -hmm. Image, and Brian K. Vaughn and Marcus Martin. And 
with it being a weekly series that is going to be five issues that is never going to be collected or reprinted, although technically it was reprinted already because of the free comic day book being reprinted for the collector's edition. Sort of. Which is, it's a different size, it's a different, not a different format, it's just, it's taller. It's like three quarters of an inch taller than a normal book. Mm -hmm. So that's making people wonder how they're going to box it or store it, which it should be fine, but it's making a lot of other retailers unhappy about the size. Okay. But one of the things that I have noticed is, even though we gave away a ton of barrier number ones, it's not affecting anybody from buying the regular edition as well Mm, i've seen there were definitely a few people on wednesday who only got issue two really yeah i I think i saw one there was Um, one subscriber specifically who did not get issue one even though it was been pulled because they had gotten on a free comic book day and then a few people off the rack who just bought issue two because they got issue one that past saturday well as someone who's buying it myself i also bought the regular number one because i want consistency yeah they're all the same size now Boy, did I hate it when Viz changed the size of their Ron Mo one half graphic novels in the middle of the run. Yeah. I want consistency. No, you don't even have them. Nope. Do you think that... And you rang people up, and I did not. Mm-hmm. Do you, have you noticed... And it's it's we're, we're only a couple of days removed. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed anybody come back that you saw for the first time? On Free Comic Book Day? Yeah. Hard to say, but I feel like not really. I mean, we've gotten... I want to say two new club members this week. They weren't free comic book day people. Though. Okay, that, that's, that's. I mean that I'm aware of. Like they were people who'd come in other days. Gotcha. I read where several stores did midnight openings. Okay. And did crazy well with it. Did they close and then reopen later? Or one of the stay stores so- did. One of the stores stayed open the whole time. Oh God. Yeah. Well, Can't you know imagine. we're dumb enough to do that. Yeah, but free comic book day, God. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's already an exhausting six hours. I can't imagine it being a less exhausting 18 hours. I just wonder if you would get the same level of purchasing at midnight. I'm curious. Well, there, there's two things to sort of think about. One is, are you just spreading out your normal free comic book day sales across 18 hours? Like, that's always been our argument for not staying open later on a Wednesday. Right. Or, but... are you going to get people who... You know, we'll we'll hit every shop in the city, or maybe they'll hit the shops by them. But if you're open at midnight, you'll get their business. Like you get them first, and that's what I think. I don't know if that makes it worth doing or not. I so I'm not. Idea. I'm not. I'm not saying we're going to do it, but I'm not saying we're not going to. Yeah, do Yeah, it it's definitely worth considering. Yeah, and and I fully believe it would be a open for two hours. I don't know. I kind of like home. the idea of being open straight through and just spreading out our our employees yeah into more shift oriented things because then you don't have to worry about some huge line first thing yeah. at 11 people are just whoever gets there at 10 in the morning just walk in and get your books uh depending on now uh dear listener don and i already had an off-air talk about what we want to do for next year and depending on what creators we come up with for appearing mm-hmm uh, we'd also have to. Would we? I I assume we wouldn't have a creator in at midnight. I mean, if they wanted to, yeah. Like we would definitely throw it open of like, hey. But that means we could also add to the mix. Yeah, you could definitely. You could do spread, shifts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting. Uh, idea. Have Have you approached anybody that you? No, I feel like it's too soon. I don't know. People book their free comic also, day folks years in advance. Uh, I believe most of the people we would be asking are in Canada. They right now. are busy doing comic books <laughs> in other countries. In other countries. Uh, so, I mean, I'm up for it. And I usually, usually right after one of these types Uh of events, I'm the first person to say, we're never doing it this way. Or, you know, I say never right away, but I'm letting you know almost a year in advance. If we decide to go that way, I'm in. Okay. I I want to I'm all in. All in. Hashtag all in. I think it's worth thinking about. It's not, it's not a definite no, and it's not a definite Yes. I, d- I want to sit with the idea for a little bit and really kind of spec it out. Sure. Because it's the sort of thing that once we announce it, it's kind of hard to unannounce it. Yeah, but I mean, there's a difference between announcing it while we're kicking about the idea live on a podcast oh, for recording. Sure. Like, this and isn't, then put, marking a... This isn't an announcement, but like actually putting it on the calendar saying we are definitely yeah. doing this, that's announcing Although, it. I mean, we know the date... I could whip up a, a Facebook event for next year's free comic book day whenever I want to. Mm. So who knows? 
He, so here's here's a, a, a counterpoint to that idea. And Close. It, it, it would, Close that day. It would it would require <laughs> the most amount of people we've ever needed to work a free comic book day. Okay. What if we were open for 24 hours? Midnight to midnight. Oh, I see. Free comic book huh. day. Okay. How about that? Yeah. That's rough, though. That's a lot of people. You need a lot of people. Yeah, but and I if, mean... And if you want to do... I mean, if you want to do, like, artists and you want to do cosplayers... I mean, there there's a lot of hours you got to cover in a lot of different shifts. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying logistically, it is a lot of work. We're putting the day that is a really in big ass. comic book day because we do have people who are like who assume we'll be open later or whatever. Yeah, and I mean, there's people who just we heard from a bunch of, of regular customers who are like, I'm I was I had work all day. I couldn't make it. Like, well, you don't have work literally all day. We do. So you do. You don't. So, so let me ask you this: uh-huh. Would we order a lot more because we'd be open three times longer? Um, I don't know. Like, some of it is we have books left over from this year. So how much of that are we going to put back out? You know? Yeah. We didn't run out of stuff this year either. And some of it depends on what what are our other costs. You know, one of the big costs that we have every year is. Um, exhibiting artists. Yeah. So, but we we've, we've well, uh... but that's the thing. Depending on how we, how that price lays out, and and one of the big ads this year was doing the dollar books for Stephen Ryan, like taking right. that sure. out and, yeah. and and reducing the cost in mm-hmm. the exhibiting artist. Mm-hmm. It changes up kind of what you can do. The immediate downside I see to this is after twenty four hours. Uh-huh. Having to do all the teardown. Um, yeah, I suppose. Or, I mean, the teardown can be staggered through the end of the evening. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, the last couple hours can be, we're slowly putting things back together. And yeah, the free comics are on these folding tables now because we want to put the bookshelves back. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can definitely yeah, man, I see like it. I, lo- I like where your head's at. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I like that a little bit better than the, we open from noon to, or, or from midnight until two, and then we close up, and then we go back, and whatever. I think... You know, midnight to midnight is a little bit easier to communicate to people. Nice. Yeah, I think it's it's worth thinking about. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll talk to yeah other challengers for, about it. For and... anyone listening to this who is expecting us to have a, a firm answer on this this episode or any time in the near future, ain't gonna happen. We will let you no. know by the end of the year. Yeah. By by the end of twenty eighteen. I was gonna say January. We'll, we'll have January. a clearer idea of what we're doing for May twenty nineteen. Uh, there's something that I've I've been wanting to do for the last several months, mm-hmm. and technology is always against me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I wanted to do a new logo for this very podcast. Oh, okay. And I did. I got it done. Cool. And I I needed uh, uh, basically it's already up for this episode, so people will have a chance to Ooh. see it depending mm. on how they. Uh, if they just listen off of iTunes, that's not changing because it's it's really difficult to change the iTunes graphic. Yeah. But um, the one on our website or the one on um, Libsyn. Okay. The the graphics the, there. The YouTube and Twitter ones. Yeah, it'll it'll have the new logo, and then it also I I played around with um, a new store logo based off of it. Yeah. Because there's a gap. That fits comics and and then oh the conversation is this the one I saw you working on a one yeah 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 I I mean from from the get go when DC announced the uh, new age of DC heroes Uh and they had a book called the New Challengers Uh I'm like I'm just gonna steal their challengers (laughs) well it it took forever to find a clean one clean one yeah they they had a bunch of ones online but they were too hard to manipulate Mm. but the one that uh, is on the cover for the one coming out I was able to play with cool and using that plus a comic craft font that that fits it mm-hmm. uh i did a, a ton of variations like white on red red on white red on black white on black all three colors and then i f- every time i wanted to make a png you got to condense the layers and then save it as a png and then undo those steps mm-hmm. so you have the layers condensed well i accidentally saved it without uncondensing so Uh-oh. uh i lost a, a lot of the individual Rookie layers and work. i know i know it i know it is so Terrence the gif would be so mad at you the, the uh contest of challenger ones are fine but the new challengers comics conversation logo which we're not using for anything i just wanted to do it mm-hmm. is just black yeah. one-dimensional black that's all i have but in case anybody will have noticed it 
ahead of time. Okay. There it is. There There's it the, is, everybody. There's a story behind that. Uh, Dell, with all this uh, free comic book day talk, mm-hmm. and I've noticed also I just say free comic day. I've been I've been Uh-oh. omitting the book to save time. Sure. You know, because we talk about it so much. I uh, mean, by, by cutting book out of free comic book day when you say it, you're probably saving yourself, I mean, two years of your life. Yeah. O- overall, when you look back, Pro- absolutely. The amount of times, sure. Yeah. Uh, with with all of that and with the episode that we dedicated to uh, a Tuesday in the life, mm-hmm. uh, we haven't really talked about the comics industry stuff in a while. It's true. Uh, I thought we would maybe go down my list of, of things in the feed and see if anything jumps out at us from recent comic book business announcements. Okay. This is going to be in no particular order, so it's probably going to be very bad for the flow of the episode. Uh, the first thing, this is something that I was kind of upset about Um DC's got a new Justice League number one coming up in about a month. Mm -hmm. Um, With a new logo, for the record. With a new logo. And because it's coming up in about a month, orders are closing for it very soon, which means DC is making a lot of announcements to retailers about how they're going to hype the launch. It's tricky how this is coming out because it's built off of the end of the weekly Justice League No Justice miniseries, Mm -hmm. which is four weeks, four issues. But it, the new number one comes out the week after number four, so it's like a five-week event now. Yeah, exactly. Um, the thing that's sort of frustrating about the way that DC's doing Justice League number one is usually the way DC will do um, sales incentives and, and incentives in general for a new launch are things like returnability, are things like overships. That's usually their tool. Uh, Marvel's tool is, uh, you know order 200% of of what you'd normally order to get a greater discount. So in theory, if you order a ton of copies, you could actually be paying less per copy, meaning you don't have to sell all of them to make a profit. You maybe only have to sell 30 or 40%. That said, you are buying in a ton of copies. So if the sell-through is is even less than 30 or 40%, if it's 10 or 20%, you are boned. You have a ton of copies you'll never be able to move. But the thing that Marvel will also do is as you're ordering in more copies, you're qualifying for more incentive covers. One in 100, one in 250s, one in the thousands. And what you can sell those scarce covers for can make up for all of the money you wasted on comic books you can't sell. That's Marvel's way of doing it. DC's, again, is more returnability. Except for Justice League number one, where almost every sales tool DC is using is out of the Marvel playbook. Um, first of all, they're going to be doing a uh, increased discount if you exceed anywhere between 150% to 200% of your Batman Lost orders. Um, we ordered a lot of copies of Batman Lost because it was a Dark Knight's Metal tie-in. We ordered significantly more Batman Lost than we would traditionally order for Justice League. Now, this is Scott Snyder and Jim Chung's Justice League number one, so we were planning to order more. But we Yes, won't... but at that at the um FOCs are like what this week? Uh, they're telling us all this now, so it's got to be in the next couple weeks. And we will pretty uh, much May fourteenth is mean, the FOC okay. for an on sale of June sixth. We will have a, a good idea. Yeah, that that's Monday. Yeah, we'll have had no justice number one numbers to figure out. We'll have like the first five days of justice. Yeah. no justice number one. That's not a, I, a great I don't, metric. I don't expect the regular Justice League book to have sales. Vastly different than No Justice. No, but our numbers for Justice League number one across the two covers they had solicited at the time, which was, yeah, just it was just an A and a B cover, I think. Uh, no, it was an A and a B and a sketch cover, or a, a blank cover, was not 150% of, of our lost Batman numbers. lost numbers. Right. It was like 140%. Okay. So now it's like, do we want to go up another few copies to make sure that we hit that level? Because what they're also doing, beyond the additional discount, is if you qualify for the either additional discount level, that's a minimum of 150% of your Batman loss numbers, you you unlock an additional variant cover, which is the Jim Lee ink-only cover for his Justice League variant. So if you want to get that cover at all for your customers, you have to qualify for that other discount. That said, once you do that, you're going to get... Uh, an additional discount off of that cover, and that's I believe. A, and, that, and at that point, will be an open order cover? Yeah, you can order whatever you want once but, you qualify for it. But we'll already have ordered way too many. Which, again, like the, the idea of the gated cover that becomes open order if you exceed the gate is a, 
straight out of Marvel playbook. They do that multiple times a month. DC has not, to my knowledge, done it. And what that means is everybody will want that Jim Lee Inc. variant mm-hmm. cover, and we'll get stuck with everything else. Yeah, uh, and then the additional thing they're doing is incentive covers, which, again, DC doesn't traditionally do. They did it for the DC Nation book, but in general, they just do A and B covers. Like, Batman comes with an A cover by whoever the normal artist is, Tony Daniel, let's say, and then a B cover by somebody else, Carrie Andrews. And you can order whatever you want by either one of those. You could order everything in the B cover or only the A cover. But what they're doing with this now is an A and a B cover and a blank cover and then a gated variant, which maybe your store qualifies for, maybe they don't. Maybe they have to stretch too far to meet that goal so they decide not to get it. And then incentive variants, which are uh, a 1 in 100 ink-only Jim Chung cover, a 1 in 250 pencil-only Jim Chung cover uh, with virgin trade dress, and then a 1 in 500 pencil-only Jim Lee with virgin trade dress cover. So right there, it's additional discounts if you order deep. It's gated variants. It's incentive variants. Everything in there is how Marvel does things. And frankly, they're things Marvel does that retailers hate. Yep. However, they're also things that Marvel does that, that retailers hate that retailers continuously reward. So while I'm angry that DC's doing this, the way they were doing it clearly wasn't working. At least wasn't working in the way that it works for Marvel. The selling for the order in for these Marvel books is huge. Constantly, consistently. So if you're if you're DC's marketing and sales department, you could offer returnability and maybe it would work. And in fact, the the original headline was earn returnability on Justice League number one with qualifying orders, before Diamond had to come out and go okay, that was a mistake. We didn't mean to say returnability. We meant additional discount. (laughs) Yeah, no returnability. (laughs) Not returnability at all. That's not on the table this time. So it's it's frustrating, and it's going to work. Like, clearly this is what the market responds to, is offering 1 in 500 covers and gated variants. Sure. Well, speaking of A covers, B covers, and frustration before Mm. we go any further. Oh, man, oh, man. This Wednesday was... The first hour was just people wanting variant covers. Almost every first hour on Wednesdays now is people wanting variant covers. And it's, it's phone calls about variant covers, people coming in for variants. Yeah. We had multiple oh, yeah. people ask for the Suicide Squad variant cover when Suicide Squad is a book we sell one single copy off the shelf. Yeah. So, one. so the idea that we would get a bunch of variant covers is like, you guys aren't buying Suicide Squad normally. Why would we think you'd want a bunch when the cover's different? But that's stupid... 2015 thinking that's not 2018 thinking all that matters is the cover that's all i should be doing when i'm doing final order cutoffs is checking every single dc variant cover because if it's an art germ variant if it's a a j scott campbell variant or jim lee variant you know who's the guy that did the reverse flash cover francesca matina yeah who cares about francesca matina everybody because oh man that cover sold out immediately two people within the first 15 minutes one coming in one calling in for, for that cover specifically. Someone had called in the Monday before, making sure we were going to have it. I had somebody buy two copies of just that cover. So dumb. I why don't get it. Why don't you buy one of each if you're buying yeah. two? Admittedly, that Dan Panosian cover was not good looking. It wasn't, but... That, and also... They, they don't... It, the story, the, the content, the everything... It, it wasn't a better or worse. It was, I just want that one variant. Also, this isn't part... Of the, it's not Flash War yet. It didn't say anything on the cover, by no. the way. Like, it says Flash War starts in May. That'll be the next issue. I guess. And we've seen the cover. It's the Wally Barry face-off cover. Is it? So I think, every... is that the annual, or did the annual already happen? I can't annual remember. Annual did not happen yet, okay. did it? Because they, no. they promoted the annual as being a big part of it, but I can't remember if that was a few months ago or coming up. Uh, it's probably the last week of the month, because it's a five-week month. Yeah, it's true. It could be. Yeah, the the variant cover thing is super frustrating. I've I've spoken about it before. I don't want to. Well, I mean, it's just that it's, that it's now that it's piling up so much at the same time, and it's inexplicable for for titles that just don't. Yeah, Nightwing. People were asking about the Nightwing variant because it was like a Jan Romita Jr. Virgin trade dress. So, like right away, people were asking about this thing when we have we barely sell Nightwing. We never have people ask for variants, but that variant. And as always, I wish these things would happen when we could do something about it. You're asking me about a variant Wednesday. I already can't get it for you. Yeah. The, the ship already sailed. This is information I could have used three weeks ago or a month ago. 
Next issue, Flash War Begins. Okay, so that's issue 46? 46 was a... 47 is is Was a road to... Okay, so realistically, the the annual will be probably the end of May, and then 47 will be the first part. Moving along, speaking of DC comic books, uh, Gerard Way made an announcement uh, today... Ooh, I probably haven't heard this yet. uh, Young Animal, in its uh, current run, will be ending in August... Um, in August, Shade, Cape Carson, Mother Panic ended issue six as was originally planned alongside Eternity Girl, which was a six issue miniseries. He's thankful to the uh, writers and artists who began the journey. It will be coming back, though. Uh, he specifically says, It's also important to me that we get the Doom Patrol schedule back on track. We'll be taking a few months' break so we can get caught up. This is not the end of a young animal. We'll have more n- news to share when we come back with Doom Patrol. So basically, assume some sort of announcement at San Diego. Yeah that sees a return in the fall or winter with a different lineup, a different uh, group of characters, probably a new Doom Patrol number one. Wild so, guess. since you brought up San Diego, uh-huh. I've been hearing... I'm not a, going, by the way. I've, I've been hearing a lot of DC chatter about all new things they're doing, what? and I assume it's going to be announced then. Probably. But... Uh, you got to understand that originally Doomsday Clock was supposed to be over by the end of 2018, yeah. so I assume okay. a lot of their publishing plans were... Here is what's coming, not coming out of that specifically, but now that that's done, these things are coming out. And as always, we saw it with New Age of DC Heroes, that stuff kind of has to come out, even if the thing that it's replacing is not done yet. Because you you have these books that you're already drawing and writing, like it it has to come out. You can't sit on them for six months. Here's what I've been hearing. Okay. I'll start with the biggest one. Okay. Green Lantern, Uh drawn by Liam Sharp, written by Grant Morrison. Okay. Aquaman gets a new writer. Okay. Kelly Sudi Comic. Okay. That's a good one. Uh, the Flash gets a new writer. Uh-huh. Landry Q. Walker. No, David Walker. Sorry. David Walker. Oh, okay. Uh, right. And there was going to be, but it got scrapped, uh-huh. a Jimmy Olsen comic. Oh, man. That would have been great. Written by Matt Fraction. That would have been so great. Yeah. Uh, and an issue was written, from what I hear. Mm-hmm. And then um, he was like, I don't want to write the Inhumans. <laughs> <laughs> these, these characters are dumb. I don't want to do this. So it, it's, uh, it's assumed that a lot of these things are happening because of Bendis. Probably. He, he's, he knows these, all these those are people. All Portland these are creators. all his friends, kind of. Yeah. I mean, and he's, he's a good ambassador for a company. Like, when he says, hey, this is someplace you should work, this is a company that, that will do right by you, people listen to him. Here's some other DC chatter I've heard. Uh-huh. Bendis the, is out. <laughs> the, number, the numbers for Man of Steel uh-huh. are, are low. Low compared to what? Compared to what they expected? Low, like, not cracking the top ten. Oh, Diamond's weird. Top 10. I mean, yeah. we're ordering a lot. And we got a lot of people down for it. Low, low, like... We're, we're basically if, ordering Batman numbers, I think. Yeah. I mean, we are. Well... But I don't know if it takes I, to crack the I top say, ten anymore. I say this, but I'm also going to add it with this. I've read Man of Steel number one. It's very, very good. That's great. I liked it better than both of the Bendis stories thus far. Who's the artist on the first issue? I don't remember. Uh, Ivan Rice. Okay, because it's different every issue. Yeah. So I, I didn't remember yeah. which one he was. And even more different as time goes by. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a moving target for that editor. I feel really bad for that. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, so while the numbers don't seem to be that big industry-wide, mm-hmm. I think it's great. I, I really well, enjoyed hopefully it. Hopefully DC has some confidence in it and, and prints to a degree that, you know... If if stores under order for issue one, they can not only reorder but make sure they can get copies of two, three, and four. That's always been the problem with the weekly series. If you guess too low on issue one, it's almost impossible to catch up in a way that you're fulfilling as much demand as you can. Sure. Which usually means that the things that you want to do as a publisher are overprint, overship, you know, do what you can't, returnability, these things are, are what you should do it. And I think they are doing it for Man of Steel. I think they're doing returnability. But like, a percentage. like other stuff they're doing, it's like percentages, and if you hit a certain level, it's DC's made it more complicated, I think, than they need to be. But again, Marvel doesn't do that, and Marvel seems to do great with selling for for first issues. So why would DC not just copy that? Now I want to point out that everything I just said are rumors. Nothing has been confirmed. Th- this is all off the record. Please, no one repeat this. And don't forget that for years we've been talking about Matt Fraction doing the X Men stuff. So. Our sources don't necessarily always bear fruit. Matt, not Matt Fraction. Oh, you're right. Um, Jonathan Hickman. Yeah, somebody else. They're the same guy. 
They are very similar people. Moving along, uh, I guess sticking with DC because they have a ton of announcements today. Uh, Mitch Gerard's uh, renewed his DC contract, so he's hanging around at that company after Mr. Miracle ends. Nice. Uh, definitely good news considering that there was a Sheriff of Babylon sequel uh, teased some time back. So in theory, uh, he might keep working with Tom King, Do which you is think what, what's good. The uh, obviously a Sheriff of Babylon sequel would not do Mr. Miracle numbers. No, but I imagine it would do considerably more than the first run of Sheriff of Babylon yeah, at this point. For sure. But I mean, it's still within the sense of like a non superhero DC project, which means the ceiling is very low on okay. that. Okay. And I don't know if that would be worth their time. I, if they want to do it, I don't think DC would be like absolutely not. But I'm sure DC would be much happier if they did a. What what is Sanctuary? Is that the uh, the thing that he's been teasing? Mm-hmm. So I mean, if yeah. It was, well, I mean, if, Sanctuary starts in Sheriff of Babylon because uh, Batman will be in the second volume. That that would sell great. <laughs> if if Batman showed up in Sheriff of Babylon, that would change a lot of people's opinion of that book. Sometimes not for the better. <laughs> More news from the comics industry. Uh, this is a minor thing, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, Bud Plant ends his forty eight year run of exhibiting at San Diego. Forty eight forty eight years. years. Uh, that, How is that even possible? That guy and that company have been exhibiting at San Diego, and it just he he talks about it a, a lot in a uh, an internet post, and the gist of it is the convention has changed. Yeah, um, the people who go to San Diego Comic Con now do not care about uh, graphic novels and out of print books and art stuff and all the things that people used to flock to the Bud Plant tables for. Conversely, the people who do want that stuff cannot get tickets to San Diego anymore. It's too expensive for them to go. It's too much work. Like, the people who were going 30 years ago were people who could just decide the week of, like, oh, I do want to go to the San Diego Comic-Con. And you'd go, and you'd go for the day, and you'd see the show, and you'd buy stuff from all the different vendors that are there. Now it's the sort of thing where you need to be, like, camping out in front of your computer a year before the, the tickets go on sale. So it's it's not the sort of show that a book vendor is going to do well at anymore. And that's... There's a sadness about that, that, that someone who is been a part of the San Diego Comic-Con, I, I don't know if it's since its inception, but very close to it, uh, is now finding it to be a show that is, is not worth it to attend. That's weird and sad. Don't blame him. No, for sure. I, it's, he, he lays it out in very dollars and cents terms. And it's we've been in that position where, where doing shows isn't necessarily unprofitable, but the amount of work that goes into it for the amount of profit you make becomes not worth it. Right. You know? Right. If you're killing yourself, spending weeks and months working on something, and then what you get out of it is, you know, what what it amounts to minimum wage, how is that worth it? You could be doing literally anything else. Um, we'll talk about a couple uh, industry moves. Oh, I know what this is. Yeah, the first is uh, Random House uh, has added a graphic novel imprint. Uh, let me see if I can get the uh, the exact name of it, because I'd never remember this stuff. Random House Graphics. Random House Graphic. It is... Uh, Random House Children's Books has announced a new graphic novel imprint, uh, which will launch in fall 2019. The imprint will report uh, to Senior Vice President Associate Publisher Judith Hout. The big deal news about it is who specifically is going to be running it, uh, the new publishing director for Random House Graphic, uh, Gina Gagliano. Gina Gagliano from First Second. Emily from First Second had spent uh, a long time at First Second, 13 years. I don't know that you could find a more well-respected person in the comics industry than Gina Gagliano. Yeah, man. Like, that is a huge get for Random House. Like, I Gina is one of the, the most professional, most competent people I've ever worked with. And so good at her job. Yeah. Ridiculously good. Uh, super friendly. Yeah, just... It's, you, you've heard us mention her numerous times. Yeah, glowingly. Most recently, <laughs> she and I were on a panel together at C2E2, and... We feel a specific closeness to her and, and a friendship with her. Kinship. And I can tell you that everybody else feels the same way. Yeah. Anyone who's ever worked with her. I, she's not on Twitter, but I was looking to see if maybe she joined or something to be able to uh, congratulate her because <laughs> yeah, I, I, all of our email addresses are... Are Macmillan, which was the people who went for a second, and I don't know if we can email her through them. Right. I should try. I'll probably try. Um, so I, w- yeah. I was looking through Twitter, and all I found were, like, hundreds of people congratulating her or reporting sure. this news. Yeah, it's it's especially huge because she had just gotten a promotion at First Second. Like, a couple months ago, she had she'd gotten a, a step up from uh, what she was doing 
in the the marketing department. So it 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 was weird that a couple months later it's like now she's at a different place. Uh, but yeah, it's super smart of Random House uh, to to snatch her up. So it's a little bittersweet for us because at first second we dealt with her directly. Mm -hmm. Like she she was in marketing. Yeah, and she would be the one contacting us to talk about books or creators or projects yeah. or whatever. It, now she's moving into editorial. Yeah. In fact, a week before this announcement came out, not even a week, maybe like three or four days, I had been emailing her about doing an event with a first second author in October and then inexplicably like like a, a switch got flipped. She's someplace else now. I don't And we already have a contact person at Random House who is Basically doing at Random House what Gina did at first second. And Gina won't be in marketing. She'll be in editing. So well, in we publishing. So, I mean, she's yeah, she's yeah. definitely in, like, the Callista Brill, Mark Siegel part of what first second was doing. Basically. You should explain who those are. Mark Siegel, I, I could be wrong, but at one point was the publisher for uh, first second. Okay. And Callista Brill is, like, the editorial director. Sure. Um, I, I just wanted context for those names for sure, people fair. listening. Yeah. They, they were involved in more of the, like putting a book together side of it and yeah. Gina was in more of the getting people to buy the book side it, of it. Gina knows everybody and it has a great nose for talent. So the comic book industry is going to get so many great new projects from her specifically, yeah. which is wonderful. It's just that we'll lose our connection with her. Sure. And hopefully someone from first second at some point will reach out and, and we'll be able to kind of keep a relationship going, even no, if it's not the same relationship. That's it. Uh, Without but, her, they're nothing. But man, if if I mean, if there's one thing I want for the industry, it's for there to be a lot more first seconds. So if if there's going to be a similar thing at Random House, that's great for us. Oh yeah, uh, the amount of and, books coming out. And for out you, that... and for you listening, because of how many great books they do. It's true. Speaking of shifts in the uh, the the publishing side of the industry, uh, we had spoken before about how Chris Ryle, who'd been at IDW for a long time as editor in chief, had had stepped down to uh, to pursue other projects and ended up at Skybound. We talked about this. Week. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, God. But uh, this week, uh, IDW announced their new editor in chief, John Barber, who is a long, long time uh, Transformers writer and editor. Uh, he had gone freelance to do more writing, and uh, now is leaving freelance to be uh, back on staff as well, editor in chief at IDW. Just as well, his uh, his writing schedule opened up. Is opening up soon? Yeah, so real briefly, we'll talk about uh, the Transformer side of it. And when I say we, I mean me. I had somebody look at the new book uh, sheet that's on the back of the monitor uh -huh. and say, Transformers Unicron, what is that about? I'm like, oh, it's the, the, the big wrap-up story to the last couple years worth of everything yes. they've been doing. And, and he said, oh, I haven't read those. I don't need that. You don't. Well, you don't have to have read that. We'll catch you up. Uh, no one can catch you up to Transformers continuity better than John Barber. Like, the stuff he's been doing recently in Optimus Prime has been crazy. Like, it is basically, he's like the Mark Grunwald of the Transformers universe. He's a guy that sees all of this weird disparate stuff, this contradictory stuff, and goes, here's how it all makes sense. Here's how these things are not errors or contradictions. Let's explain how these two completely incompatible things are actually true in, in a way that makes the story 50% better for having those two things in them. The The Transformers' current continuity is going to be wrapping up at the end of the Unicron storyline um, in August, I believe. August, September. September, I think. So in, in the fall, winter, there was going to be relaunches. And the, the two main writers they have now are John Barber on Optimus Prime and Unicron and James Roberts on Transformers Lost Light. Um, James Roberts had already said that when Lost Light concludes in in September... Uh, he will be stepping back from the Transformers books for a while. Um, he's been writing them pretty much continuously since 2010. So he's been on a Transformers book for over 80 issues. Like, a long time. So that guy deserves a break. With with John Barber moving to editorial, there's a little bit of a concern of like, well, who's going to be writing the books? Because your two best writers... Your third best writer was Mar Marguerite Scott, and she decided she did not want to continue... I'm sorry, who who's... This concern? Who's concerned by this? Readers of Transformers oh, books oh, who are I'm sorry. enjoying the current I, I, line of books right, that okay. are, are as good as they've ever been. So people who shop at other stores. Right. No one who buys these things at Challengers because we, we don't really sell them. But people listening to this who could be Transformers fans who are reading the IDW books have been a little bit concerned Hi, about Jermaine. what the continuity looks like going forward. What who Who are the creators going to be? Because you don't have 
a deep bench of Transformers writers that can keep it going. Um, but if John Barber is editor in chief, there's almost no one better suited to find that next wave of talent to pick the people who are going to keep the books going and, and keep pushing boundaries on them and keep uh, innovating and energizing the the brand in a way that almost nobody ever has. I feel like there was an Energon uh, there's not. pun there, nope, but I, there's definitely not. I didn't there's want to even go not for one. it. So, yeah, it's... While John Barber, I'm sure, will do a lot of things for a lot of different books there, specifically for the Transformers section of the IDW publishing plan, uh, very excited to see a guy like that in a decision-making role, in, in a way that he's able to say, I care about these books, I'm not writing them anymore, but they are important to me, and I want to make sure that the best work is coming out from them. You know, there's often times when we record this podcast mm-hmm. where we don't look at each other. Mm-hmm. And I, I know specifically, like, my my gaze will wander, but it's true. we're ultimately still talking to each other and just assuming other people are listening. This time I was watching you and you, you were just, you were you were in it and you mm-hmm. were going. Sure. And you, you knew you weren't talking to me. No, I, I know <laughs> you don't care. I know you don't have a horse in this race. You're not, you're not uh, trying to figure out, yes, but I who do, could be my, the next key my, writer my horse, for the Transformers My horse is franchise? Grimlock. Uh, That's I, a robot, right? Yes. To be fair, you should have, have picked a, a horse robot, which I believe would be from Beast Wars Neo, and it's, I think his name is Stampy. Yeah, it's from the Japanese franchise. Come on. Stampy? Uh, uh, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to make sure. So you can talk briefly about this other recent publishing announcement. Uh, Matt Kent and Tyler Jenkins have a follow-up. Yeah, to Matt Kent and Grass Tyler Kings. Jenkings, who That's were doing Grass up. Kings, which is wrapping up. I'm just repeating everything Dow just said. Thank you. Which was a really good series from Boom, and it was fancy cover stock and good paper and uh, a watercolor series. Uh, a really good Stampy, murder... Stampy was a rabbit. I'm sorry, go on. Murder mystery type series that's coming to an end. They're doing a new book called Black Badge, and it is about secret agent Boy Scouts. Like, Boy Scouts who were actually military scouts. Like, missions that adults can't get done, these Boy Scouts go on. And it looks great. And uh, I like, like I said, like I like Grass Kings very much, and uh, I, I think it's weird that they just did it in hardcover. But it, Grass Kings is definitely worth a read. There's basically two... There'll be three trades, but like two stories that they're doing, two okay. arcs, I guess. That's how it feels to me. Um, I'm very excited for Black Badge. Yeah. Mach Kick, by the way, is the horse transformer that I'm thinking of from Beast Wars Neo. Is that M A C H? M A C H space K I C K. Mach Kick. Again, huh. again, it's for the Japanese line, so the names are even dumber than they are in America. Sure. Yeah, uh, I, I think the idea of, of Black Ops Boy Scouts, or I keep doing that, it's Black Ops Scouts. Because there's boy and girl scouts in, now, in this team. Yeah. Specifically in this team, there are boys and girls on the team. Uh, it's just such a killer idea. Like, I I don't love Tyler Jenkins' art. We talked about this. But I think this is a very cool concept for a series. I admit when they, they first announced Tyler Jenkins' Diesel, mm-hmm. I said, who's Tyler Jenkins? He, he was Diesel in the WWE. Oh, wow. Yeah. I thought that was Kane. Uh, that, no, it's not Glenn Jacobs? No. Was it Rick Bogner? Yes. <laughs> that was fake Fraser. Okay, here's one last thing. We'll do this one last thing, and then we'll do the uh, the TCAF thing, because they kind of do feed into each other. There was... I, d- I don't usually care about 2000 AD. Uh, I'm not... I don't have that part of my comics upbringing where I got really big into, like, Judge Dredd and UK comic scene and stuff. But uh, June's 2000 AD sci-fi special features a story by Emma Beebe and Babs Tarr, making it the first ever all-woman creative team on the character. Uh, although th- this beat story that I'm quoting says June, but then uh, the 2080 tweet says this July, so I don't know. A ton of amazing creators on that specific sci-fi special. Tula Lotte's doing a cover. Uh, writers include Alex DeCampi, Leia Moore, art from Emma Vicelli, Sam Beck. Uh, it's also got a future, a future Shock by Tilly Walden and a, a Judge Anderson poster by Marguerite Sauvage. So it sounds... Insanely good. And again, I'm not a 2000 AD guy, but I will definitely be grabbing a copy of that for those creators. How weird for us to just carry that issue. Uh, I don't know if we would get like a bunch for the rack, but we might get like one or two. Yeah. You know? Uh, I don't think it's been offered to us yet, and we're ordering for July, so I don't know if that'll just show up for us in uh, August, maybe? I don't know. August or September? I don't know what our usual turnaround is for 2000 AD. I don't think it's 
set in stone. Uh, finally, as Patrick mentioned, TCAF is is the, this weekend as we're recording, so a lot of fun folks are going to be in. Uh, and that stands for Toronto for the Toronto Comics Art Festival, held in a library. Yeah, the Toronto Reference Library, which uh, Scott Pilgrim readers will recognize from a scene in Scott Pilgrim. I don't know if it was in the movie or not. Maybe can't remember. But uh, the Toronto Reference Library is gigantic and beautiful, and uh, it's the. TCAF is a, is a free-to-attend event. Yeah, you just walk in and there's a bunch of different exhibitors and a, a cool I, I panel I feel track. like Chicago's cake mm-hmm. took a lot of inspiration from TCAF. Yeah, TCAF was the, kind of the, not the first of, but a, a huge part of the blossoming of the comics art festivals all over North America. Um, TCAF is one, cake is another. Uh, uh, Brooklyn had one for a while. Cab, I think. Comic Arts Brooklyn, I think, was was the the Brooklyn show. There, there's plenty all over the US and Canada. And what is the, the, uh, the South by Southwest one? CXW? Or that might be a wrestling federation. No. Uh, you're uh, thinking of uh, Crossroads Columbus? Yeah. Yeah, it's in Columbus. Right, but I mean, I I, I said... I, mean, I meant Oh, like you meant was... like South by Southwest with the X in it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, Crossroads Columbus. But I mean, the the whole idea was modeled off of South by Southwest. That's CXC. What... Yeah, because the, the, the idea behind uh, Crossroads... Maybe more than I don't know how much TCAF does this, but maybe they do it a ton, and maybe Crossroads are still for them too. Um, was the idea of doing a full city event where it's not just a thing that happens one day at a place, so much as it's almost like Angoulême, where it's all over the city, yeah. little little satellite events here and there um, as publishers and creators and, and people want to do fun stuff. Um, but TCAF this weekend uh, has a very fun panel happening at two forty five p.m. Um, I don't remember which day. It's called Men in Comics. Men in comics. Yeah, the description uh, from the uh, the schedule is, Men have a long history in comics, both as readers and as characters. This panel is a chance to talk about the decisions that creators make when writing and drawing male-identified people, as well as how the how these creators' experience with men in comics have shaped their work. Uh, featuring Caitlin Major, uh, Yasmin Omar Atta, Sheikh Alugtu, and Sanya Anwar, moderated by Ellery Harris. Those are all women. That's the joke. How great is it? It is literally the reverse of a woman in comics panel. Yeah, uh, a fun reaction to the number of women in comics panels that have not featured any women on the panel. Here's men in comics with no men on the panel. Yeah, it's great. great. It's great. It's such a great joke. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a good panel, too. Yeah, everyone on there is super talented. Sheka is from Chicago and has done several things at Challengers and will again in the future. Sheka's great. Uh, Sheka has, has... uh, started to do more publishing because she's very good at it. Yeah. Um, she's um, created and published a bunch of her own work. And as someone who's very good at that, it's nice to see her applying those skills to people who need that help. Um, not every comic creator is able to kind of shepherd their project from thought to finished book. Uh, it can be very difficult for them. So having someone who can, like a, a, a Spike Trotman, who's able to not only like create stuff, but also like do the nuts and bolts of it in a way that other artists maybe are not able to do is great. I think it's fun when people share their talents like that. Agreed. And you can share your fun, if you are a woman, at <laughs> Women's Comics Night this upcoming Monday on May 14th. The theme is Last Minute Cosplay. Yep. And then, like we said before, on May 25th, there'll be the Spectacle Release Party. And then on Saturday, June 2nd, it'll be the Adventure Time Here Initiative charity event. On Monday, June 4th, it is our next book club meeting for Gwenpool, Volume 1. And then on Monday, June 11th, it will be another Women's Comics Night event. This one is a pajama party. And that is what we have lined up, but there's always plenty of great books in the store. There have been so many good comics coming out recently that I feel like we don't have the ability to highlight every good one that comes out. We're trying, and I and I don't I don't want people to to miss stuff. We're trying, but uh, if you you know if you come in, we'll we'll point them out to you. Yeah. Thanks for listening, and keep reading comics. This has been Contest of Challengers. Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. Challengers is located at 1845 Northwestern Avenue in the Bucktown neighborhood of Chicago, 773-278-0155. Keep up to date with new releases and events at challengerscomics.com. Like Challengers Comics on Facebook, follow at Challengers on Twitter, 
and help fund this podcast at patreon.com slash challengers.